Welcome to r slash petty revenge, where a woman tries to blackmail OP into handing over her baby. Our next Reddit post is from Help I Hate Texas. This happened way, way back. My daughter is 30 years old now. When I was 18 and in my first year of college, I got pregnant. The father joined the Navy to escape responsibility. My parents, who are strict conservatives, except when it's inconvenient, abandoned me and cut me off financially. They wanted me to have an abortion to prevent the loss of my scholarship. That's how I found myself at 18, suddenly and totally responsible for myself and my living situation with no financial or emotional support from anyone. I lived at a private dorm and was befriended by the property manager, Donna. When I told her my situation, she swooped in like a hero and helped me get a place to stay at one of the other properties she managed. She then helped me get a job at a gift shop at one of those properties. I thought she was the most wonderful person for all of this, until her true motives became clear. She wanted to adopt my baby, even though I had expressed no interest in giving my baby up for adoption. After a few weeks of working, she launched a campaign to convince me that I was unfit to be a mother and that my baby would be so much better off if I let Donna have it. At first, it was subtle, passive-aggressive remarks about how much money she and her husband had, how she couldn't have children herself, how she hoped she'd be able to adopt one day, and what a wonderful life they would give their baby. But as time passed, her approach became more aggressive and direct. She was always around the shop and would even come to my apartment, ready to point out things that I did or didn't do that proved what a terrible mother I'd be. She went into long rants about how awful I was for having a baby without a father, how we'd be welfare trash forever, how God brought her into my life because she was meant to have my baby. It was endless and constant for months. Sometimes I let her comments upset me and make me wonder if she was right, but in my heart, I knew that I would be a good mother. For a while, because I was feeling intimidated, I let myself be bullied into including her in baby-related events. I even let her go with me to a sonogram where I found out that my baby was a girl. She was so excited! As I got closer to delivering, I got stronger in making clear to Donna that I was not giving up my baby. I tried to avoid Donna as much as I could, but was regularly reminded how much power she had over my living situation. I soon had coworkers telling me that she was claiming that my baby's adoption was a done deal. She had even told people that she was decorating a nursery and buying baby girl clothes. When it became clear that she was not going to change my mind, she started threatening me with eviction from my apartment and firing me from my job. That way, I'd realize how unstable my situation was and recognize that I would have no business having a baby. And sure enough, I lost my job. She fired me for not wearing my shoes behind the cashier's counter at the gift shop. When I was on my feet all day, my feet would literally swell right out of my shoes. I'd stay behind the counter and slip off my shoes for a bit, but never in view of the customers. Still, that was reason enough in Donna's mind to teach me a lesson. It didn't take long after losing my job for me to also lose my apartment. I ended up couch surfing and even spent some time homeless until I got some housing assistance. In the meantime, I'd gone to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and complained, and they helped me mediate with the owners of the gift shop property. As a result, Donna got fired from managing that property, and I got months of back pay and some extra money for my trouble. You know, in exchange for not outright suing them. This small cash windfall turned out to be a huge blessing that actually enabled me to survive financially until I had my baby and could get back to school. Donna firing me was the best thing that could have ever happened. I saw her years later and she's still childless. And the best revenge? My daughter is now getting ready to graduate with a full scholarship and magna cum laude from a top law school. Turns out, being raised by a single mom isn't as awful as Donna thought. I think the world's probably better off that Donna never had a kid. Based on this post, she doesn't seem like a very good person. Our next Reddit post is from Psych Nerd. My freshman year, I had the most inconsiderate roommate who'd stay up all night talking loudly, eating my food, etc. Oddly, my washcloth that I used to wash my face would go missing. I thought someone was taking them, but I had no idea where to. 
Well, at the end of the semester, we were clearing out the bathroom cabinets to move out. And what did I find shoved in the far back corners of the cabinet? My washcloths, which were covered in orange foundation. It was clearly evidence from my one rude roommate because she wore so much foundation every single day. I was super annoyed because I had to keep buying more washcloths to replace the ones that she stole. Well, I decided to use one of my other washcloths and clean the disgusting bathtub with it. I'm talking ring of shampoo, dirt, hair everywhere. I was planning on just throwing it away, but I decided to hang it up and let it dry in the same place I would hang my washcloth for my face. The next day, the washcloth that I'd used for the bathtub was covered in orange foundation. The look on her face when I told her, no regrets. I love this top comment from Coder Joe. Did you use my ass cloth? Our next Reddit post is from Morgan Nikon. My husband passed away two years ago. He was a remodeler who had a broad list of clients. I had a good friend Amy who was 42, and Amy had an adult daughter, Kiki. To do my friend Amy a favor, my husband would hire her daughter, Kiki, for some of his larger remodeling projects. During that time, Kiki would occasionally borrow things for her own projects. A portable CD player, a pair of channel locks, a winch and come along, a table saw, chainsaw, a Graco cart paint sprayer, an air compressor, and a nail gun. Whenever Kiki borrowed something, the item was clean, in working order, in good condition, with all relevant parts included. Every single time Kiki borrowed an item, it took forever for her to return it, and when she did return it, the item was either broken or missing parts. Over two years, Kiki managed to cost my husband nearly $5,000 in losses. Finally, he quit hiring her as a helper because he caught her stealing from one of his clients. And he forced her to put the item that she took right back and then kicked her off the job site immediately. Last September, I was visiting Amy and Kiki was there. Then, Kiki hit me up for what she called her promised inheritance, which was the first that I ever heard about it. Given that my husband and I spent the last eight years of his terminal illness talking about what he wanted after his death, given that he gifted things of his that he wanted friends to have before he died, I knew damn well that he didn't intend for Kiki to have anything. My husband left no will. Amy knew that my husband had quit lending her tools after getting the cart paint sprayer back. That was a $1,200 purchase and was less than four months old when Kiki borrowed it, and she returned it broken in ways that the warranty wouldn't cover. Now, our state is a community property state. When a spouse dies without a will, only the surviving spouse inherits. So, Amy told her daughter to back off, but I got the bright idea of how I was going to handle getting rid of all that broken stuff that was still taking up room in the old tool shed. So, I told her I'd be sure to pick something out for her, even though her own behavior was the root cause of the bad blood between herself and my husband. So, the next day, with Amy's help, I dropped off all the broken tools and busted up CD players that Kiki borrowed from my husband at her apartment. Kiki wanted to know what I expected her to do with all this junk. I told her that I expected her to do with them whatever it was that she expected my husband to do with them after she returned them broken. Now, she's the proud owner of a bunch of useless tools, and I get to reclaim nearly 35 square feet of space in what is now my tool shed. Man, after stealing tools from the husband, she turns around and tries to steal tools from the widowed wife as well? Ugh. Our next Reddit post is from Odd Implement. First off, where I'm from, weed is illegal. I'm very conscious about the smell, and I understand that for non-smokers, the smell of weed is horrendous. I completely understand why, and I always do my best to avoid any discomfort to anyone. That's why I usually smoke late at night, when I know that everyone else should be asleep, including my downstairs neighbors. The thing with this guy is that he's a heavy tobacco smoker, and I can always hear him coming in and out of the terrace. Mostly because he shuts the door so hard that the walls shake. From the pattern of slamming doors, I can tell that he smokes his last cigarette at around 2.30am. Therefore, I decided to go for my nightly puff at 3am. I opened the windows, turned on the oil diffuser that's also anti-tobacco, and lit up my joint. 15 minutes later, cops knock on my door. 
Alongside them is my neighbor, and I get taken to the police department for statements. I end up with a warning for possession, a fine for disturbing the peace at night, and a sleepless night. Before this point, he wasn't exactly a friendly neighbor either, but his wife was sweet from the few interactions I had with her. The first few days after I moved in, he always gave me the death stare, but I assumed that he was just grumpy. Fast forward a few days. I'm scrolling through Grindr when a new profile pops up at the very top of the list. All of my neighbors are mostly elderly people, so I was quite confused as to who this is. I clicked on his profile, and it was him, my neighbor. I started a conversation with him, sent him a picture of a friend, with my friend's consent, to pretend that I was him. A couple of hours later, we were sexting and he sent me a couple of nudes. The next morning, I caught his wife before going to work and showed her everything. When he came home from work, I could hear a lot of crying, and he eventually got kicked out. It's worth mentioning, they also have a 16-year-old kid. I am very satisfied with my revenge, but I also feel terribly sorry for both the wife and child. They didn't deserve this. What do you think? Well, OP, let's make one thing super clear. You didn't break up that guy's family. He did when he tried to cheat on his wife. Also, on top of that, this guy's just a moron because picking a fight with your upstairs neighbor is just dumb. Because what's stopping OP from practicing dancing at 5 a.m. and keeping them up all night? Nothing. Our next Reddit post is from Nada Bimbo. This happened during my junior year of college. I lived with five other women, Abby, Brooke, Danny, Ella, and Fran. When we signed the lease on the house, we agreed to a one-year deal. The house was off campus and unfurnished, so we needed things to make it feel like home. Prior to moving in, we all sat down and decided what we needed for the house and who was going to bring what, and also settled on a chore schedule. We also decided that we'd have a household supply fund set up so we could buy things we'd all use, like toilet paper, paper towels, dish detergent, and laundry detergent. As it turns out, Danny, Ella, Francesca, and I bought most of the stuff we needed, like a couch, small dining table, dishes, silverware, drinking glasses, cookware, food storage containers, etc. Things went pretty well during fall semester. Shortly after that, however, things started to decline. Abby's boyfriend, Andy, basically moved in with us, and the two of them started acting like they owned the place. Left a dirty dish in the sink, they'd leave a passive-aggressive note about how rude it was to do that. Come home after the library closed at midnight? Well, Abby and Andy went to bed at 10, and if you woke them up, there was hell to pay. Pretty soon, Brooke and her boyfriend Brad were acting in much the same way. By early February, it was clear to Danny, Ella, Fran, and I that we did not want to live with Abby and Brooke for another year. The four of us found a different off-campus place and signed a lease. We let Abby and Brooke know, and from then on, the two of them, plus their boyfriends, went from being partial jerks to complete jerks. They do things like stop our clothes washer mid-wash, take out our clothes, dump them on the floor, and then start their own laundry. They'd use up all the hot water by taking super long showers. They'd write return to sender on our mail. They destroyed flowers that our boyfriend sent or brought to us. They refused packages. They stopped contributing to the shared supply fund and stopped doing chores. About a week before Memorial Day, Ella got a call from the landlord of our new place saying the previous tenants had moved out and we could move in early if we'd like, no charge. Danny, Ella, Fran, and I discussed it and we decided to get out of our current house ASAP but not tell Abby and Brooke about our plans. Memorial Day weekend rolls around, and Abby, Brooke, and their boyfriends head out of town to go camping while the rest of us put our plan into action. With the help of friends, Danny, Ella, Fran, and I got all of our stuff moved out. And when I say all, I mean all of it. Living room furniture, dining room furniture, dishes, silverware, cookware, food storage containers, baking supplies, dining curtains, rugs, lamps, vacuum, broom, dustpan, etc. We all decided that since neither Abby nor Brooke had contributed to the shared household supply fund since March, then the toilet paper, paper towels, dish detergent, laundry detergent, and so forth was ours, so we took all of that too. Abby, Brooke, and their boyfriends were shocked to return from their camping trip to an empty house. What made our petty revenge even sweeter was that on their way home from the camping trip, all four of them got food poisoning and were really, really sick. 
The scathing text messages we got about moving out unannounced and taking all the shared household goods, especially the toilet paper, priceless. Danny, Ella, Fran, and I are still great friends and get a good laugh about the situation 12 years later. None of us have heard from Abby or Brooke since graduation. Ooh, they were puking and pooping their guts out. And they didn't have, let's see, paper towels, toilet paper, laundry detergent. Ugh, that was going to be a stinky, stinky house. That was our slash petty revenge. And if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.